structure of this winter school uh, on electronic storage calculations. It's my pleasure for me to introduce Professor Yabana from University of Tsukuba. He is a leading expert on the first principle studies on light matter interactions. So he is going to give us a lecture this morning on time dependent and functional theory in real time, uh, subtitled with linear and nonlinear optical response. So we have Professor Yabana online. So Professor Yabana, you, it's all your uh, time. So please go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Yeah, I'm Kazuhiro Yabana from uh, University of Tsukuba, Japan. And yeah, I'm very much honored to be a lecturer in this winter school. Yeah, in my talk, uh, in my lecture, I'd like to explain you time-dependent density functional theory in real time. It's a, one of the extension of the density functional theory, but the, it's a time-dependent one, so excited state or electronic dynamics. And I'd like to focus on the, uh, in the real time version. So we describe the electronic motion in real time. And I'd like to explain how we manage it. We can calculate such dynamics and how such calculation is useful, especially in optical response. So it's a light matter interaction. So uh, let me start uh, with the, uh, my, yeah, let me start introducing myself briefly. Yeah, I'm, Actually, come coming from not the uh, community of uh, first principles condensed matter calculation, but the a bit different field. It's a nuclear physics. So you know the atomic nuclei is a very tiny material inside the atom. And then, after taking the PhD, uh, I started to work on nanoscience and electronic dynamics and first principles calculation. So I actually started such research when I was 30. And then uh, I gradually moved to the uh, working on ultra fast electronic dynamics. That is the uh, popular field in light matter interaction. And now I'm in Center for Computational Sciences. Originally I was in Department of Physics but now in Center for Computational Sciences and belonging to two divisions. One is the uh, quantum condensed matter physics and the other is my original field, nuclear physics. So the, my center is the, uh, aiming at co-design for supercomputing. That means the, so the, in our center, the, there are people working on developing supercomputers. And also there are many people using supercomputers, particle physics, astrophysics, nuclear physics, condensed matter physics, life science, and global environment science. So the, there are people in very many fields using supercomputers and collaboration for such purpose is the uh, main purpose of our center. So yeah, I'm thinking to give in this way in, yeah, I divided my lecture for five parts. First part is the introduction I'm just talking. And then electronic dynamics in real time for isolated system and periodic system that I try to uh, give a talk in the first part. And I'm thinking to spend about one hour for first three part, and then have a small break. And afterwards, one hour, I will uh, talk on nonlinear electronic dynamics. And the final part is the light propagation calculation in the first principles approach. That is the five topics. So. Yeah, let me continue the introduction. 
So yesterday, I think you already learned much about the density functional theory. So it's uh, widely used in chemistry, physics, material science, but the, it's basically limited to electronic ground state. So the, it's not very much useful for optical science. Optical science is the light matter interaction. So if light is irradiated on material, then electron starts to move. But the usual density functional assembly is for ground state. So it cannot describe the uh, light matter interaction. So in my lecture, I like to focus on time dependent density functional theory. So it's an extension of the density functional theory so that we can describe motion of electrons. The, actually, the, this is a bit related to my uh, history. The, I, as I said, I started to work on nuclear physics and the such time-dependent density functional theory has been very popular in nuclear physics from around uh, 1970s. And then it was uh, in uh, condensed matter physics and also atomic and molecular physics, the TDDFT, especially linear response version has begun around 80s. And then the, in 84, there was a lunge gross theorem. This is correspond to the hohenberg cohn theorem. hohenberg cohn theorem is a very basic theorem of the static density functional theory, but the corresponding one in time dependent extension was done around 84. And then from 90s, the uh, linear response TDDFT calculation, I will explain later. It becomes very popular in quantum chemistry that describes the e electronic excitation in molecules. And also real time TDDFT, this describes the time dependent motion of electrons explicitly that started around 1990. And my lecture is mostly on this real time TDDFT and actually, it's, a, it's my field. I have been working last 30 years in this field. OK, so let me very briefly explain the basic theoretical aspect of TDDFT. OK, first, let me summarize the density functional theory in Consham framework. So. Okay, you learned already a study. The Consham equation is usually the basic equation in density functional theory. And the Consham Hamiltonian includes the kinetic energy, the electron ion interaction, Hartree potential, and the exchange correlation potential. This exchange correlation potential is a magic quantity that supports the success of the density functional theory. So the exchange correlation potential is a functional of density. So it can in general be non-local in space. Non-local means that the exchange correlation potential at position R is a functional of density and may depend on the density at different position. So this is the uh, basic equation in ordinary density functional theory. The what is the time dependent extension is the, okay, Consham equation now becomes a time dependent equation. So the single particle energy now becomes a time derivative. So this is the, uh, looks like a time dependent Schrodinger equation. And Consham equation, Consham Hamiltonian, it looks very similar, but the now kinetic energy, electron ion energy potential, Hartree potential, and exchange correlation potential becomes now a time dependent. 
And also we apply some external field to induce the electronic motion. So this external potential that we choose for some purpose we want to analyze. And the, okay, exchange correlation potential is now time dependent. So it's a functional of uh, density. So it can be non-local in both space and time. That means the potential depend on density of different space and different time. But of course, the uh, potential only depend on the density of the past one. It's a restriction by causality. But the, in most applications, I, I will show later many, many applications, but in most applications, we use a adiabatic approximation. That means the, we just use the exchange correlation potential in the ground state. So the same as the uh, usual density functional theory, the same potential. So uh, we use the density at the same time we ignore the retardation effect and use the ground state density functional. That, that is very often used in actually in uh, time dependent extension. Okay, so the I do not uh, explain in detail the basic of the TDDFT, but the, there is a very good textbook uh, written by Kerstin Ulrich. So yeah, if you have interest, the yeah, I recommend the, this book, Time Dependent Density Functional Theory Concepts and Applications, that includes the very much very detail of the uh, basic theory and also uh, applications. Okay, now I'd like to uh, start the to explain some historical part of the real-time TDDFT. So as I said, I worked on atomic nuclei and later on condensed matter physics. And the, okay, yeah, actually this is the uh, book, Concepts in Solid, written by Philip Anderson. And yeah, it's, he write in the following way, Baratin, Saules, and others, started to work on time-dependent Hartree-Fock theory in nuclear physics. So yeah, of course, you know the name of David Saurus. He's the Nobel Prize uh, winner in condensed matter physics. But actually, he started his career in nuclear physics for time-dependent Hartree-Fock. So the, because the atomic nuclei, its a, size is very, very small, but the ingredient are protons and the neutrons, they are fermions. And in condensed matter physics or atomic and molecular physics, the electronic motion is a problem and electrons are fermions. So although the size of the system is very different, the both nuclei and atoms, molecules, solids are many body fermionic system. Because of that, the very common theories are very useful. So let me show first uh, example, a yeah, very old example of the real-time TDDFT. This is the 1978. The collision of two atomic nuclei is simulated by uh, TDDFT. And OK, this is my one of my uh, recent work in this nuclear physics field, but the collision of two atomic nuclei taking place by solving TDDFT. Okay, you can see two atomic nuclei collide and making a single big nuclei. And if this collision is successfully synthesized new nuclei, this is the atomic number 120. This is the yeah, this has never been uh, observed, but anyway, this is the trial of such uh, nuclear collision simulation. 
But because the atomic nuclei has many protons and there is a Coulomb repulsion, the after a long time it's separate into two fragment. It's known as a fission process of nuclei. So anyway, this kind of the collision dynamics has been described by TDDFT, and this was this has been uh, used in nuclear physics. But the, then the, it has been uh, used uh, also in uh, very uh, widely used in condensed matter physics. So I'd like to show several examples of TDDFT calculations now. And I will later explain theoretical and computational method and also the applications later. But the, at first, I'd like to show, show uh, several uh, examples. The electronic motion in nanoparticles, periodic crystalline solid, ion atom collision, and the light propagation. Okay, first one is the uh, linear response of metallic nanoparticles. So this is now presently called. So this is actually my first uh, calculation of real-time TDDFT in uh, condensed matter physics. So this is the lithium-147. So the metallic nanoparticle, the, the, this is a ground state electron density because the, it's a metal. So electrons are distributed inside nanomaterial, nanoparticle. And we apply some external field, then electron starts to move. So you can see some motion. The blue part, it shows the electron density decreases. And orange part, the electron density increased from the ground state. So you can see anyway, there are some oscillation of uh, electronic motion. The, at the very first of the calculation, it is some, there are some coherence in the upper part and lower part, but the coherence gradually disappears. So, okay, taking the center of mass of the electron density, that is the polarization of this, nanoparticle, then you can find there are some damped oscillation in the dipole moment. And taking Fourier transformation, we get the optical absorption spectrum like this. And green points are the experimental value. So it can reproduce the photoabsorption or it's a plasmon resonance of the nanoparticle. That is the one uh, application. Okay, let me move to other example. Yeah, I will explain later the very detail of the calculation. But anyway, let me show several examples. This is the electronic motion in crystalline solid. So this is a example of crystalline silicon. So you see there are silicon atoms here, and this is the ground state electron density is shown. So between silicon atoms, there is a high density region of uh, electrons between atoms. So this is a bonding electrons. So this is a ground state density functional calculation, but then we apply electric field to this material. Then in TDDFT, real-time TDDFT, we can describe the electronic motion inside the crystalline solid. So you see electrons are start to move in. And you now find the bond are broken. So actually, we in this calculation, we apply very, very strong laser pulse. And it makes the even the material instantaneously to plasma state. Plasma state is the electrons and ions. The electrons are almost completely ionized system. Then 
the uh, bonds are broken instantaneously. So such kind of dynamics can be treated by real-time calculation. Okay, third example is the uh, collision dynamics of ions with atoms. So here is the atom. This is argon atom. So it includes eight valence electrons. And we collide with the argon ion of eight plus. So there is no valence electrons. So actually here it's ion, but we can see no electron density. Now they start to collide, the ion is coming. And then electrons starts to transfer by the Coulomb field. So it describes the charge transfer reaction of atoms. So the electrons moved, uh, transferred to inter-ion is very highly excited. So it's um, moving, but anyway, it's the collision dynamics, application of collision dynamics. I will not uh, tell detail about this one later. Okay, final example is the uh, light propagation. So this is the uh, example of the light interaction. This is the light pulse, electric field. It's not electric field, but the vector potential. Vector potential of the light pulse is coming. It's the wavelength of 800 nanometer that correspond to 1.55 electron volt. This is the uh, typical laser pulse of Thai sapphire, Titan sapphire laser pulse of wavelengths 800 nanometer. And colliding with the thin film of silicon in this example. The, okay, you can see silicon atoms here. So the thickness of 10 to 20 layers of atoms. So the thickness is 2.7 nanometer. So in this uh, scale of the light wavelengths, 800 nanometer, the thin film of 2.7 nanometer looks just like a line here. Here is a thin material. So we just expand this part here. So this is the, in the ground state. And we solve the Maxwell equation and TDDFT simultaneously, then we can describe how light propagates and the electron moves. So light is coming, then electrons are starts to moving. Then the light is split into transmitted wave and reflected wave. So this is the another kind of application I will later show in, uh, in detail about this calculation. Okay, so the up to now is the introduction and the I explained how the overview of the uh, electron dynamics calculation. Yeah, if you have any questions, simple questions, just ask me. Uh, yeah, later I'm thinking to have a, a question time, but the, during my uh, lecture, uh, I, I will be happy to answer simple questions. So next, I'd like to move the second part, the electron dynamics in real time for isolated system. Isolated system, I mean the uh, atoms or molecules or nanoparticles. So the, I'd like to explain the optical response, light matter interaction and linear optical response. Linear means the uh, field is sufficiently weak so that we can use a perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. So first I write several remarks for the interaction of light and uh, matter. So interaction is dominated between electrons and electric field of light. So not ions, ions is very heavy. So mainly the interaction is between electrons and electric field and magnetic field is not important. So 
as I said, the for linear case, we assume a perturbation theory is usable. That, that is usually uh, okay for ordinary light. For example, for sunlight, the uh, perturbation theory uh, works uh, ex uh, almost exactly. And I'd like to note that there are two spatial scales and single time energy scale. So two spatial scale, I already mentioned that wavelength is very long and the size of material is very small. So we can use a dipole approximation that is the electric field is almost uniform in the scale of this material. So wavelength is so long that we can treat the electric field as a uniform field in the size of material. And single scale of time energy means, the, okay, the laser pulse, typically we use a visible laser pulse or infrared or ultraviolet. The energy range is about a few electron volt. And the energy, excitation energy, or gap of the energy is typically one to 10 electron volts. So energy scale is almost the same. So that, that is the meaning of single scale of time and energy. Okay, then the most important quantity for the light matter interaction in dipole approximation for isolated system, it's a polarizability. So let me explain what is the polarizability. So we apply electric field. As I said, the electric field is the most important. And we consider the molecule, atom or molecule isolated system. Then the polarization is the important quantity. Polarization is just the center of mass position of electrons. So, we can just define the polarization as the electron density and the coordinate operator. So then for weak light, if the perturbation applies, then, then the polarization is a linear function of electric field. And the, these two, polarization and electric field is connected by polarizability. This is in general uh, difference of time time between these two. Okay, because, the, because of the causality, the polarization at time t is completely determined by the electric field of the past time. But then taking the Fourier transformation, because this is the convolution integral, the Fourier transformation is just a, a product of three quantities. And this, a uh, Fourier transformation of the polarizability is the, uh, we look at frequently the frequency dependent polarizability. That is the uh, major, major, usually uh, major in experiment. So let me briefly uh, explain the basic properties of this polarization. So for that purpose, the, this spring mass model will be useful. Okay, you you just familiar, very familiar with this uh, spring mass model. The mass is connected by spring, spring constant K and friction G and mass M. And we assume that it has a charge. Okay, we regard this mass point as the electron. So it has a charge minus E. So then applying the electric field to this mass particle, then the, it satisfies the uh, Newtonian equation motion. So the first uh, standard method we treat in classical mechanics is the forced oscillation, driven oscillation by sinusoidal fixed frequency field. Okay, if we apply the fixed frequency external field, you know the solution is the 
motion with the same frequency. So then, yeah, as I said, the polarization is the center of mass electron. In this case, there is only one electron. So the position of electron is the polarization. Yeah, we have multiply minus E, but anyway, the position of electron is the polarization. And it's proportional to electric field. And the polarizability we obtain, that this one, this is the, actually the amplitude of the uh, forced oscillation, driven oscillation, the amplitude is the polarizability. So if we drew in figure, the real part is the red one, and the imaginary part is the blue one. So imaginary part shows the peak position at the uh, fundamental frequency of this spring mass. Okay, root, uh, square root of uh, K over M is the position of the uh, resonant frequency. Okay, this is a well-known result in uh, classical mechanics. So we also learn, you also learn in classical mechanics, the damped oscillation. So if we apply initial velocity, to give an initial velocity, we actually exert impulsive external field. So we highlight the external field as the impulse I times the Kronecker delta. This is the impulsive force, and I is the magnitude of the impulse. Then, of course, you know well, the, the, the damped oscillation. So, okay, this is a time domain description, and the, okay, this is a definition of the polarization, and we assumed electric field is the impulsive one. So, polarization is just uh, this damped oscillation is the polarizability as a function of time. So the polarizability as a function of time behaves damped oscillation. So this is a damped one. And so these two polarizabilities, of course, the same thing, just a Fourier transformation. So the these two damped oscillation and time domain uh, damped oscillation and the frequency domain forced oscillation, driven oscillations are uh, uh, related by Fourier transformation. Yeah, usually in university course, the, we learn classical mechanics before learning the Fourier transformation, but the, it's a very good uh, exercise of the Fourier transformation. Okay, the, then I'd like to move to the quantum mechanical material, but actually the polarizability of atoms, molecules, and nanoparticles expressed as a sum of the classical oscillator. So this is the exact result, but the uh, quantum mechanical material, the polarizability is just a sum of many, many oscillators. So the, what is these numbers? The frequency of the spring mass is the excitation energy. So each excited state behaves as a spring. And here appears the oscillator strength. This is something, uh, yeah, I do not explain in detail, but it's related to Schrodinger equation of the uh, quantum mechanical material. And this has a meaning of the number of electrons. So we can get the exact expression. So we can get the, this expression using the perturbation theory. But anyway, my message is that in quantum mechanics, the polarizability just behaves like a classical spring mass model. It's an exact result. And the each excited state behaves just like a spring and mass. So now I'd like to move to the definition and the real-time calculation of the polarizability 
in TDDFD. So, okay, as I said, in TD time dependent quantum equation is given by this one. And okay, here we apply some external field and then solving this time dependent quantum equation, we get the electron density. Initially, this is in the ground state, but the applying the external field, the electron density changes from the ground state. So as the external field, we use this uh, linear potential. Okay, as I said, the, we treat the electric field as a uniform. For example, in this case, I write the external field in z direction, then the potential becomes the electric field times coordinate z. So we put this external field here, then electrons starts to move. So then in TDDFT, we get this electron density and we can calculate the center of mass position of electrons in TDDFT then we can get a polarization. And this polarization should be related to electric field and the coefficient is a polarizability. So we can define the polarization in TDDFT by this equation taking Fourier transformation, the, it's the ratio of the Fourier transformation of the polarization and the electric field. This is nothing but this equation taking free transformation. So this is the definition, how we define the optical response of isolated material in TDDFT. And okay, calculation, for the calculation, we can use this relation, but the simplest one is the impulsive potential. Okay, as I said, the if we use a uh, impulsive force in spring mass model, then it gives the damped oscillation. Initial velocity is given and the damped oscillation appears. So we do that in TDDFT is one of the simple choice. So external field is just a uh, impulsive one, delta function in time. So the if we apply impulsive force in classical mechanics, the particle gets the initial velocity. But in quantum mechanics, okay, initially in the ground state, and we apply the time evolution operator just before the impulsive force to just after the impulsive force. And then integration of the external field gives the delta function disappears. And the, because this is a very short time, the quantum Hamiltonian contribute nothing. So then the uh, ground state wave function is multiplied by plane wave. Brain wave comes from this external field. The external field is the impulsive, impulse times coordinate. So it's a brain wave. So yeah, this is a very simple result. The, in the classical mechanics, if we apply impulse, then particle get velocity. But in quantum mechanics, if the particle is in ground state, then the after impulse, the plane wave is multiplied. So then this is the initial condition for the orbital. And then we make a, a time devolution calculation. And then the polarization is obtained by taking a Fourier transformation of this polarization. So by this way, we can calculate the polarization. So yeah, I think it's better to show you the practical example. This is the case of uh, S3 molecule, C2H4 molecule. 
okay, two carbon and four hydrogens. And the, at present, I show the ground state density here, E plane and perpendicular plane. So you find there is a two ca carbon atoms here. And here you can find two carbon atoms and four hydrogens here. This is the electron density. And we apply, as I said, the ground state orbital is multiplied by plane wave, but the density do not change. This is just a phase factor. So density do not change, but the wave function is modified. So then we use this as the initial orbital and calculate the time evolution. So I show here how the electron starts to move by this distortion of the prime wave. So you now find electrons are oscillating. So let me show again, the, you will find immediately after impulse multiplying this plane wave, immediately after the calculation, you find there are two electrons are emitted in up and down directions. Okay, first there is uh, some flux in up and down direction, but then the steady oscillation continues. So taking the dipole moment, this is the center of mass position of electrons. So first there is an emission of electrons, as you find there are uh, emissions of electrons up and down. And then afterwards there is a very steady oscillation. This actually corresponds to pi pi star excitation. This is the electronic excitation in molecule. And taking the Fourier transformation of this oscillation, we get the polarizability. And the actually this imaginary part of the polariz polarizability is proportional to uh, optical absorption cross-section. So taking the Fourier transformation and the, taking the imaginary part, we get this curve. So this steady oscillation gives the some excitation energy around the seven electron volt. This is the electronic excitation in S3 molecule. And here is the high energy tail peaking around 20 electron volt. This is a photo ionization process. So the, that comes from the, this peak. So initial emission of electrons uh, makes the uh, continuous photo absorption cross section. So by this way, we can make a, a linear response TDDFT calculation for uh, molecules. So this is the uh, comparison with the experiment. So the, this photo absorption cross section is a very basic physical quantity. So I show several nitrogen molecule, water molecule, H2O, benzene, and carbon 60. And blue circles are experimentally measured photo absorption cross section. And red curve is the TDDFT result. So you can find for all molecules, the uh, TDDFT gives a very accurate description of the uh, linear optical response. Okay, so yeah, I explained how optical response of molecules can be calculated in real-time TDDFT, but the actually this linear response TDDFT, there are, uh, this real-time calculation is not necessary. Real-time calculation is one of the methods, but the, in fact, in most quantum chemistry software, for example, Gaussian, the other methods uh, which do not use the time evolution calculation uh, usually adopted. So I do not have much time to explain, but the, I'd like to explain basic idea. So again, 
it's simpler to explain in Newtonian mechanics. So let me explain how we calculate the small amplitude vibration in Newtonian mechanics. Yeah, this you already learned in university mechanics course. So if the particles are described by some potential, then the equilibrium position is the position where the force do not act. So this is a ground state calculation. Then the small, small amplitude vibrations, the, we expand the potential up to second order around the equilibrium position. So they appear the Hessian matrix. Then the equation is linearized. Then the to, to calculate the excited state, excited state means the normal mode vibration. The one of the methods often used is the IM value method. Eigen value method is used to uh, obtain the normal mode of vibration. And this is the actually used in linear response TDDFT calculation most frequently, most frequently. And other is the driven oscillation or impulsive oscillation is the method I already explained, real time method. So the derivation of this IM value method is rather complex, but the yeah, yeah, if you have interest, then yeah, just look at it later. We linearize the time-dependent quantum equation and take bring it into the matrix diagonalization equation. This is the most frequently frequently used in uh, linear response TDDFT calculation for molecules. Excuse me, Professor Yabana. Yeah. There is a simple question in chat window. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, yeah. so one person asked uh, about the uh, dissipation process in experiment. Uh, he is wondering how the effect is treated. It, it says it seems that the process is missing in calculation. The process means dissipation. So the okay. his question is so, what is the effect? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So let me explain. For example, in this case, in experiment, you find the photoabsorption cross-section is somewhat uh, averaged. But the, in TDDFT calculation, it is very sharp. Actually, this is related to the uh, relaxation. And the, this smoothing in the experimental uh, data comes from the uh, molecular vibration. So electronic motion couples with the vibrational motion, and that makes the uh, excitation smoother. But the, in the present calculation, I just fixed atomic positions. So that, is, that makes the uh, every peak very sharp in the TDDFT calculation. But for this purpose, the simplest way is just to take an ensemble average. So I mean the we consider the distribution of ionic position, the in molecules, the at finite temperature, they are at the some excited states of vibrational states. Then we, the simplest way to take into account such vibrational motion is to make a sampling of the atomic position because the uh, ionic motion is very slow compared with electronic motion. We just ignore the velocity of the ions and just sample the positions. That is the one of the way. And by that way, we can mostly describe the uh, smoothing by ionic uh, position. Yeah. Okay. Let me tell the, okay, this was a, a metallic nanoparticle example. This is actually the uh, linear response calculation in metallic nanoparticle. Yeah, as I said, the, this is just the electronic motion just after the uh, impulsive force. And taking, fully, taking the dipole moment, this is the center of mass of the position of electrons. It's a damping oscillation. And taking Fourier transformation, we get the plasma frequency here. 
So it's around three electron volt is the position of this plasma resonance. So let me explain our standard understanding of the plasma resonance is the classical motion. And perhaps you know such kind of explanation. If we shift electrons somewhat, then they appear the surface charge and they appear the electric field and the, uh, they appear the uh, oscillative uh, equation and we get the plasma frequency. And for nanoparticle, the uh, restoring force electric field is weaker than this thin film case and the frequency is somewhat smaller. But anyway, the plasma frequency is completely determined by this electric field inside the material. And let me explain how such electric field is treated in TDDFT. So this is here in Hartley potential. So in Hartley potential, if electrons move, then the, this charge distribution changes. And that makes the uh, screening effect inside the material. And so the, to have the plasma resonance, this dynamical screening effect is very important. So actually, the, this kind of screening effect, the, that brings the Hamiltonian time dependent, is very important even for very, very small system. This is a case of atom just crypt krypton atom, rear gas atom. This was uh, one of the first calculations of linear response TDDFT done in 1980. But the, okay, if we ignore the time dependence coming from here, then absorption cross-section becomes like this. And increasing, incre uh, including this time dependent motion of electrons, this screen, time dependent screening effect, then we get this curve. And experimental data is this crosses. So the, what tells here is that the Hamiltonian is very, very important even for very small system of a single atom. Okay, yeah, I thought to come to third position, but now we are around, I spent 53 minutes. So I'd like to have a question now and the small break after the questions. So yeah, please uh, give us, give me the question if you have any. Okay, so no. if you have any Bring up questions. Uh, you are showing this uh, uh, example of M2 uh, mm -hmm. in the middle. And uh, you mentioned the electron uh, the emissions. Uh, oh, sorry, the right before this uh, example, uh, ethylene, I, I, I assume. Mm -hmm. So then in your calculation, actually, the number uh, of electrons is not concerned. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Ah, okay. Also, uh, there could be several types of different uh, excitations, optical excitation, right? So electron can be bound within molecules, but then uh, what you are showing here is uh, rather strong perturbations that will uh, actually emit the electron from the molecules. Mm -hmm. But then uh, in the later uh, slide, uh, actually in this slide as well, you are uh, 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 showing us the, the photo absorption uh, the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I was confused that uh, this uh, photo absorption spectrum, I assume that the electron usually bound within molecules uh, with the small perturbations. Okay. So, yeah, so in other sense, it seems that uh, you are simulating the electron ionization process where yeah. you have very strong perturbation and electron is taken out of the system, but then uh, the experimental data you are showing on the right hand side is actually uh, small uh, kind of activations that will uh, basically electron will be excited or excited state mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the, the molecular regions. So, could you comment on that? 
Yeah, okay, yeah, it's a very, very good question. And actually the, yeah, I have, I do not have sufficient time to explain detail about the, about it. But the, it's a, it's a characteristic feature of the linear response phenomenon, linear response calculation. Linear response is the, okay, if the field is weak, every time we can assume a superposition principle. So the, in this calculation, we apply impulsive force. So the electrons are emitted. High energy electrons are emitted, but the low energy electrons are still bound. So that is the, in this calculation, but the experimentally, for example, this photoabsorption cross-section, yeah, I showed here, the usually experiment uses the fixed frequency laser path. So, for example, this circle uses the photo uh, laser pulse or uh, yeah, some, some light pulse of 30, fixed 30 electron volt pulse. Then only photo ionization takes place. So the experimental situation and the calculation using the very different external field. So that is why the, the, there is not one-to-one -one correspondence, mm -hmm. but the, in this calculation, yeah, as I said, the electrons are first going to, so impulsive force, then, then there is a first photo emission process. And that explains the high energy part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And this continuous vibration is the electron is localized inside the material. So it describes the low energy region. So, the looking at in time domain and frequency domain, we look at the different dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe it's not sufficient explanation, but the in, in such a way, the two dynamics are related to each other. Experiment and calculations are uh, related to each other. Mm -hmm. So partly also related with discussions uh, in terms of uh, accuracy or with the direct comparison with the experiment. Uh, you did mention the, the exchange correlation potentials uh, you are using, but then I assume you use more or less uh, LDA or GJ type local or semi local potential, is that right? Yeah, yeah. In this oh, calculation, okay. we use uh, adiabatic approximation. Yeah, in fact, I do not say in detail, but the, we use some uh, long range collected potential, the, the potential that has a uh, Okay. Uh, one over our Coulomb potential. That is okay. important to get the correct yeah. threshold position. But All the, right. So you can uh, see included it all here. So yeah, yeah. In this hard. calculation, we use uh, some potential that produces a long range one over our potential. But the, oh, okay. we, we assume a adiabatic approximation, no retardation effect in this calculation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so it seems that we have another question from Seyong Park, so please. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for the uh, nice lecture. I have a question about adiabatic approximation. So so uh, I, I would like to know uh, when this is more or less exact and when this start failing and what length scale or time scale I need to, uh, is concerned with this, when, this, when we uh, think about this approximation, it, is correct or not correct? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, but very difficult question to answer. The we think retardation effect should be important, but the it's not very easy to find a, a simple form of the functional. So that because the for example. It should be very different between metallic system or band gap systems. The retardation effect should be very different, but the, because we assume uh, some locality of the function uh, functional, it's extremely difficult to uh, think about the universal functional that have the uh, retardation effect. So the at present, I should say that the, for, for example, for such quantity, photoabsorption cross section, adiabatic approximation works very well. So we just not satisfied, but the 
using without much investigation. That, that is the, in my present impression. For metallic systems, it's more simpler. The, the, for metals, uh, we have the, uh, some retardation effect we can learn from the uh, matter calculation, uniform matter calculation. So in such case, we have some chance to include the uh, uh, non-adiabatic effect. And there are several such kind of investigation ongoing, for, the, for example, for the dielectric function and so on. Yeah, let, let me just check my understanding. So what you mean by adiabatic approximation is electrons are more or less instantaneously react to the uh, external electric field in this case. And when this is satisfied, then we can uh, more or less believe we can use the uh, functional, we can uh, the N, like, like a N, R, and T. Is that the, what you mean? Yeah, the adiabatic transformation I mean is the use the density functional for the ground state is used at the same time. I see. So, but what about the, your uh, the what about the ground state? Because what you said is I can use density in terms of local R and T. And what about the ground state when so in, in when there are lots of uh, extension, then it seems that it's not anymore valid. So is it works with a small extension or what do you, ex what's the, your opinion about that? Yeah, but the, this ground state density functional theory is included in this TDDFT. If we just assume a time independent solution, then it comes to the ordinary Consham equation. So if we assume uh, uh, this adiabatic approximation, then it's perfectly connected to the ground state. I see, but the, this function can be uh, also function of like a uh, excitation, like uh, some how much it deviates from the ground state density and so on. So what... yeah, the theorem yeah. by Lunge and Gross. Uh -huh. is that the, there is a, some uh, functional, universal functional, that is the only functional of density. Mm -hmm. I see. So that's kind of uh, give some uh, more support for that this kind of uh, uh, treatment. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so there, there should be some functional, but the not only non-locality in coordinate, but also in time. So it's a very complicated material, but we should expect there is some, some, something just dependent on density, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we can continue the, this interesting discussion after the, after the lecture. So it's already 11.03. So we will have like five minute break and then come back and to listen, continue to listen to the excellent lecture from Professor Yavana. So we'll have a five minute break. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So please come back by 11.08. So Professor Yabana, since you are still there, can I ask a simple question? Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is kind of dynamics calculation. So I think you need a lot of computing resources or the disk space to save to your, your, your computation data for later analysis. So how, how is about that? So do you need a lot like large supercomputers or a lot, large disk space? Yeah, that's true. For isolated molecule, 
small molecules, we can just use the usual PC for the calculation. But the, for solid, for example, we need to make use of many, many K points. And then we, the, we need a supercomputer to calculate. How about disk space? Do you need a lot of storage? Yeah, disk space is not so much. We need to store the ground state wave function. Oh, I see. So, you, you, don't, you don't need the, the, the stepwise wave functions or densities to, for, for analysis. Yeah, in the time evolution, it in the memory. So I, I see. we do not use storage here. Okay, thank you. Another simple question is that I, I, I think you may have some slides for this uh, topic, but can this idea or formalism be applied for electron phonon systems, do you think? Uh, sorry, I did not catch your question. You base, you mostly uh, showed your result, the interaction between electrons and light, but mm -hmm. this the time-dependent formalism can this be applied <clears throat> to electron phonon system, do you think? Uh, you mean phonon? Yes. Uh -huh. Ionic motion. So yeah, yeah, I yeah. In the today's lecture, I need to completely omit that part because of the restriction of time. But the yeah, there are applications in usually classical treatment for ions. Oh, it's the still not so much explored. There are, yeah, for calculation of electronic motion, it's much simpler. For phonon motion, we we actually do several calculations. For example, coherent phonon is one of the popular phenomena measured in condensed matter physics, and that can be described. Okay. And also thermal effect is the, also can be treated. But the, for example, the energy transfer from electrons to phonons, it's uh, still not clear if it can be described well or not. Yeah, it's just an ongoing <laughs> piece. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think it says the eleven oh eight. So I believe everybody is back from a short break. So let's resume the lecture from Professor Abana. So please, Professor Abana, please continue. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'd like to move uh, move for the three. Yeah, I actually thought to finish up to three in one hour, but the, yeah, it's I'm somewhat late. So yeah. I just omit some several things that are not very important. Okay, the next one is the periodic system. So yeah, I just start with the explanation for the block theorem. Perhaps all of you know well about it. For periodic potential, infinitely periodic potential, we can assume the form of the wave function is the plane wave form times the periodic function. That, that is very important to treat the uh, infinite system. But the, okay, if we use this potential, yeah, this I used for uh, isolated system, electric field times coordinate, then, this potential is a linear potential in coordinate. So it's violate, the potential violate the periodicity. So we cannot use the Bloch theorem. So this is first problem we need to overcome. So to, for that purpose, we use a general, uh, we use a gauge transformation. I just write a very general gauge transformation here. Okay, just to explain briefly. So the 
you know well the gauge transformation for the vector potential and scalar potential, but we now combine it to the wave function. This is the quantum orbital we expect. But anyway, using the gauge function f and changes the vector potential, scalar potential, and also wave function, the physical quantities do not change. Physical quantities, the density, current, they are calculated from the orbitals and electric field and magnetic field, all the invariant. So anyway, there is a gauge degree. I think we have a connection issue. with the coordinate dependence disappears by this gauge transformation. Instead, the momentum operator becomes the, uh, includes the vector potential. So yeah, it's uh, by this gauge transformation, the periodicity of the Hamiltonian is destroyed. So the, we use the vector potential instead of the scalar potential. This is scalar, pot scalar potential. Instead of this scalar potential, we use a vector potential, then the periodicity of the Hamiltonian is restored. So then the, okay, this is the time-dependent quantum equation in velocity gauge. We call this vector potential form as the velocity gauge, and then we, can apply at each time the Bloch theorem. Then we have the time dependent quantum equation for Bloch orbitals here. So Bloch orbital is the periodic function. So by this way, we can calculate the electronic motion in infinite material. This is the, uh, one of the uh, calculations I showed at the beginning of my lecture. So the solving this time-dependent quantum equation, we can describe the motion of electrons inside the crystalline solid. Okay, I skip this part. Okay, so now let me show how electrons move for a pulsed electric field. Yeah, I now use a, I first use a very weak pulse Weak pulse is the, okay, the magnitude of the electric field is in some unit volt per angstrom, the 0 0.01 volt per angstrom. Then, okay, here I apply this electric field, but you see electrons, this is the electron density, but you can not find any motion of electrons. So anyway, the field is very weak, so electrons, do not look to move. But, okay, I drew the change of electron density from the ground state. Then the electronic motion can be seen. Here you find there are some change of electrons. Orange region is the increase of electron and blue region is the decrease of electron. But the, after the laser pulse gone away, comes back to the ground state. This is because I used, again, the 1.55 electron volt. This is a Chitan Sapphire laser pulse. And okay, this is below the direct band gap of silicon. In this calculation, I use a LDA. And then the direct band gap of silicon is 2.4 electron volt. So this is below laser pulse is below the band gap. So the, it's a transparent region. So after the laser pulse goes away, the material becomes a ground state. That is the uh, transparent material. So 
So yeah, you saw the electrons are moving like this. The, in this case, the electric field in the upper direction, upper direction, and then electrons are more here and less electrons here. So electrons are moving like this by the external field. The bonding electrons moves up and down. That is the uh, typical dipole motion induced by the weak electric field. Okay, other quantity, we can calculate the electric current that we can calculate. So let us look at electric current. It's almost similar to the electric field, but actually the polarization is proportional to electric field. So current is the pi over two phase different. Okay, this is the electric current. And another quantity we can calculate is the excitation energy, electronic excitation energy. This is irradiating, then electrons are moving. So there appears the electronic excitation energy. So anyway, electrons are moving during the laser pulse. There is a energy uh, that is the square of the electric field. But the, after laser pulse gone away, the, it comes again to the ground state. So this is a transparent region. Okay, so for such calculation, real-time calculation, we can also get the uh, dielectric function. So the current is related to electric field by conductivity and the polar, polar, polarization is the integration of time. So it uh, gives us susceptibility. And the electric displacement is the sum of the electric field and polarization. So it defines the dielectric function. So by this way, the in TDDFT, the conductivity, susceptibility, dielectric functions are defined. So again, the one of the convenient methods to the real-time calculation is the applying the external field of the impulsive one. So we give the initial velocity for all electrons inside material. Then the this electric field, impulsive electric field gives the shift of the vector potential. Vector potential is just the step function. So step function of vector potential gives the impulsive electric field. So that means the initial block orbital just after the impulsive force is just to shift the K point, K plus is the comes in quantum equation here, K plus A. So vector potential shift means the K point is somewhat shifted. This is the initial condition. And then we calculate the dielectric uh, time evolution of the Bruch orbital. Then we get the conductivity and the dielectric function. By this way, we can calculate the dielectric function in real time formalism. This is of course one of the methods. And for linear response, there are many other methods to calculate dielectric function. So this is a typical calculation of the dielectric function, but unfortunately in TDDFT and especially with adiabatic local density approximation, the quality of the dielectric function is very, very limited. This is real-time calculation, and we first calculate the electric current flowing inside the material, and then taking the Fourier transformation, we get the uh, information in the frequency domain. But the, this is the real part and imaginary part of the dielectric function of silicon. The dielectric function of silicon in experiment, it shows the two peaks here in the imaginary part. But in adiabatic local density approximation, it looks a very different shape. So the quality is not sufficient by adiabatic local density approximation. That is well-known defect of TDDFT for 
solid. And there are several improvements. This is local density approximation. And this is the, if we use a hybrid functional, that is the uh, non-local folk term is included, then the description is much improved here, this blue, blue curve. Or there are some other method, bootstrap approximation is uh, invented for this linear response. And I'd like to say one thing, the for crystalline solid, the exchange correlation effect is not sufficient for this potential. Potential is periodic in space, but we also need a exchange correlation effect for vector potential. That is said to be very important. And this is one of the recent uh, proposal for this choice of the exchange correlation potential for the vector potential. And if we use some simple form for the exchange correlation potential, that is the proportional to the, the second derivative is proportional to the electric current, then it is said that the, this double peak structure is very well explained by such choice of the exchange correlation potential. Okay, so now I move to the next uh, slide. So let me... move to another slide here. Okay, can you see this screen? Yes, very well. Okay, so I know O is the nonlinear electronic motion. Okay, let me just pass this part. Sorry. So one of the frontier of the laser science is using the extremely intense and ultra short laser pulses. The, that was, that subject was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics 2018. And these two persons invented a method to make a very strong and very short laser pulse. And such kind of laser pulse is used in many purposes now in optical science. So let me explain what is strong and what is short, intense and short. So typically we say, if the laser pulse is very strong, the, this electric field is comparable or bigger than electric field felt by electrons in Bohr model. So the Electric field felt by electrons in Bohr model for hydrogen atom is the one atomic unit of electric field. And if the applied laser pulse is comparable to such electric field for electrons inside material, then the field is strong. So if the applied electric field is even stronger than this one, then the electric field is of the applied laser pulse is much stronger than electric fields that bind electrons inside material. So the, we expect the electrons will be soon removed from material. And the duration is also compared with the, this period of electronic motion inside hydrogen atom. So 
the, this is one atomic unit scale. So the duration is if sufficiently small, we can even measure the electronic motion inside atom. So, okay. Let me remember, this was a weak pulse case I already showed. So you saw the electrons are moving, this bond electrons are moving up and down. And when the laser pulse goes away, the material comes to the ground state. That was the weak pulse case. But now, I move to a strong pulse case, the electric field maximum value becomes much larger value, two volt per ohm strong. Then, okay, just changing the intensity of the laser pulse. You now see electron density is moving and you can now see the breaking of the bond. Okay, looking at the difference of the electron density from the ground state, then what happens is that. Okay, now electron density decreases in the bond region and the electron density increases in the atomic site that you can find. And also after the laser pulse gone away, the electron density changes. So as I said, for weak pulse case, the material comes to ground state again. But for very strong pulse, the material do not come to the ground state, but the excited states. Electrons are gone away from the bond region. So the bond electrons are removed from the matter region. So other quantity is the electric current and excitation energy. So let us look at it. The current is not smooth now. There appears the nonlinear current. And also there is a electronic excitation energy for weak field, the energy comes back to zero. But for strong field, there is a permanent energy transfer from the laser pulse to material. So this is the nonlinearity. Look at the sharp shape of the current and the, this excitation is a multi-photon absorption. So the Single pulse, single photon is not sufficient to excite, excite above the band gap. But the, if the two photon absorptions, that is the second order in perturbation theory, then it can exceed the band gap. So the permanent photo absorption is possible. That kind of nonlinear phenomena takes place. So I summarize the energy transfer for various intensities for very weak field to strong field. And the energy transfer as a function of intensity. And I show three lines. One is the 1.55 electron volt that I showed previously. This is two photon absorption. Two photons are necessary to exceed the band gap. So the laser pulse is if 3.5 then the one photon absorption is possible. So this is proportional to intensity, one photon absorption curve. But the, if the frequency is 0 0.28, three photons are required. So the this region is the multi-photon ionization region. And the for very strong field, the, there is no frequency dependent. This is a tunneling ionization region. And there has been a Kirdish formula. Kirdish was the yeah, theoretist in 1960s. He developed some complex formula that describes this 
dependence of the energy transfer uh, almost reasonably, but the, it's still a very complex formula and it includes many approximations. But anyway, it's, it catches the uh, qualitative uh, future. But anyway, there are two regimes, multi-photon and tunneling ionization that I, let me explain more. So in optical excitations, there are two time parameters, laser frequency and tunneling time. So if the laser frequency is very low, very, the, yeah, the laser pulse frequency is very low and the laser field changes very slowly, then there is a time that, okay, electric field makes the potential by some way, by this is a linear potential picture in length gauge, then electrons here can be emitted by tuning ionization if the uh, laser pulse is very low frequency. So in such tuning case, it's insensitive to frequency. But the, if the laser pulse direction of the laser pulse changes very quickly, then there is no time for such tuning. And the, in such case, multi-photon ionization takes place, the many photon absorption. In that case, the, it should be very sensitive to the frequency because the number of photons depend to exceed the uh, band gap, depend very much on the frequency of the laser pulse. So in such a way, the, we know there are two mechanisms of multi-photon for very low frequency, low intensity region, and the tunneling ionization at high intensity region. So this is another very popular and interesting phenomena. This is the high harmonic generation from atoms. So high harmonic generation is the, okay, if we apply some laser pulse of very low frequency, but then there appears the hundred times of the applied laser frequency, the emission of the photons of about tens to hundreds times of the uh, laser pulse appears. So in this experiment, the laser pulse is applied the 0.88 electron volt, or blue one is the 1.55, but the emitted photon is about 80 to 90 electron volts. So it's the uh, 60 times of the uh, incident pulses observed. And such kind of the nonlinearity is explained by three-step model. So Electrons are first going to vacuum by tunneling ionization. This is from atom case. So going outside and then laser pulse direction changes and then colliding again with the original electron crowd. And that makes the high energy emission possible by such uh, mechanism. So this is the PDDFT calculation. This is for argon atom and we apply this kind of the laser pulse. So as the laser pulse gradually increases, The electron starts to move and then ionized by tunneling mechanism. And then you can see the emitted electrons coming back to collide with the ion. That is the, called the rescattering process. And that makes the high energy, emission of high energy photons possible. So anyway, this is the dynamics. And we calculate the polarization as we did. So polarization is initially 
proportional to the applied field, but comes very complex when the field becomes very strong. And then taking the Fourier transformation of this dipole moment polarization, then we get the high harmonics. This is the fundamental field, three times, five times, seven times, and yeah, 20 to 30 times frequency appears. This is the typical calculation of the high harmonic generation from atoms. So high harmonic generation also emitted from solids. And yeah, this is a very hot topic last 10 years. The first and the emission of the high harmonics from solid has been very much uh, interested in, partly because the, if such high harmonics can be generated from uh, tiny crystalline solids, then it can be used a very good uh, generator of the uh, ultraviolet light, or even soft X-ray light can be obtained from a very small uh, apparatus. Yeah, usually the X-ray can be generated by very big machine, but the in this mechanism, the laser pulse, just a laser pulse plus a small crystal makes the uh, very high frequency photons, so it can be a very good device. So, okay, this is the typical TDDFT calculation in silicon crystal. So we apply and then we get the current. And again, the, when the field is strong, there are very, very complicated uh, current appears. And taking the Fourier transformation of the current, we find there is a high harmonic generation included. And the, okay, this is a maximum amplitude of the electric field. If we increase the electric field gradually, then we find a higher and higher order harmonics starts to appear in this current. But the simultaneously, there is a electronic excitation becoming larger and larger. And actually around this excitation energy, one electron volt per atom, this is a rather big value. Then we expect the crystalline solid with melt. So this gives a permanent damage for the material. So if the material is damaged, then it cannot be used as a device. So we want to operate the device below the damage threshold. So 0 0.3 is the appropriate one here. And even at 0 0.3 EV, we expect uh, emission of very high harmonics is expected. So the strong high harmonic generation signals appear at the intensity is very close to the damage threshold. So it's a competition between the high harmonic generation emission and the permanent damage to the material. So this is another example of the TDDFT analysis and the experiment. Experimentally, so if we increase the laser pulse intensity, the, okay, this is a measurement of glass, silicon dioxide. So it's a transparent glass and irradiates the strong laser pulse. Then it becomes the flow of the electric current. Okay, because of the very high field, the electrons are excited and the, it can make possible to make a electric current between these two uh, plates of the, so that takes place around 10 to the 13 watt per square centimeter. The, that is actually close to the damage threshold. The damage threshold is around 10 to the 14 watt per square centimeter. And the TDDFT calculation, we can make a TDDFT calculation for this silicon dioxide. And then the 
uh, as the intensity increases from 10 to the 13 to 14, the, we find there is actually a conducting electrons starts to appear in this, this is logarithmic scale. The, there is a very high increase of the uh, carrier increasing comparable to experiment. So this is one of the recent uh, uh, comparison with the recent measurement. Okay, now I'd like to move the final topic of my lecture. It's the light propagation calculation, the Maxwell TDDFT approach. So up to now, I explained how electron moves when we apply very strong or weak electric field. But now, let us think about how we can describe propagation of the extreme light. So for ordinary light, of course, the light propagation can be described by macroscopic Maxwell equation. So if we just solve Maxwell equation, we can describe the propagation of light. For example, the finite difference time domain method is one of the popular method to solve the Maxwell equation. But the, to solve the Maxwell equation, we need a constitutive relation that connect between electric displacement and the electric field directory function. But of course, you know the for extreme light, the this we cannot use this dielectric function because the sometimes the interaction is nonlinear. So okay, then combining the Maxwell equation and TDDFT directory, then we can describe light propagation without constitutive relation. So the mission is very simple. The light propagation can be described by Maxwell equation. Yeah, in terms of the vector potential, Maxwell equation looks like this. And the electronic motion can be described by TDDFT. So you see here is a vector potential here, and that comes here in TDDFT. And solving the time-dependent quantum equation, we get the electric current that is the, comes here in the Maxwell equation. So just coupling these two equations and solving simultaneously, there appears no need for the constitutive relation. But the, yeah, we develop such framework solving both equations simultaneously. But the, to connect these two equations, we prepare two methods. One is a microscopic one, and the other is a macroscopic one. So you know the, in electromagnetism, there are two kinds of electric field, uh, electromagnetic field. One is a microscopic electromagnetic field that oscillates in the scale of atoms. And the other is the macroscopic electromagnetic fields that we obtain after averaging with the smoothing. So in the numerical calculation, we also prepare these two kinds of approaches that I'd like to explain now. So let us think about the problem when the laser pulse goes to some thin material. Okay, this is the explanation of two approaches, microscopic approach, microscopic Maxwell plus TDDFT, and light one is a macroscopic one. So let me first explain microscopic one. This is very sim conceptually simple. Okay, we want to solve Maxwell equation and time-independent quantum equation simultaneously. 
So just simple choice is the, okay, here is a sim material, target material here, and we prepare some grid point to solve these two equations. Just a single grid point to solve both equations simultaneously. That is a very simple approach. And I already showed in the first part of my lecture, this figure, this is the thin film, 2.7 nanometer thickness of silicon. And the light pulse is the 800 nanometer. So the thin film looks just a line here. But applying the laser pulse and solving Maxwell equation and time dependent quantum equation simultaneously, we can describe light propagation, transmission and reflection, and the electronic motion simultaneously. So it's a very simple method. So this, the initial condition is here, the laser policy is in front of the material, the material inside is a ground state. So here I show the electron density, this is ground state. And the laser pulse is coming, there is an electronic excitation. And the laser pulse are going, gone away. There is a transmitted pulse, reflected pulse, and inside the material, there is an electronic excitation left because of the nonlinear interaction for strong field. And taking the fully transformation of this transmitted pulse and reflected pulse, you find high harmonic generation appears. This is a typical nonlinear signals. So in this way, okay, it's successful, but the problem is that this is 27 nanometer thickness. So this is 27 nanometer, still much smaller than the wavelength of light. Wavelength of light is 800 nanometer. So it looks like a line, but you, can imagine this is a heavy calculation. There are many, many atoms here. We use a periodic boundary condition in vertical direction, but still the computation is very expensive. So the maximum possible thickness feasible in usual supercomputer is the up to 50 nanometer. So we cannot describe it thicker material, but in optical science, we we are interested in material whose thickness is comparable to the laser uh, wavelengths. So we, can, we want to treat much, much thicker material. So then this macroscopic approach will be more useful. So this is computationally very different. This is a natural extension of the macroscopic Maxwell equation in electromagnetism. So, okay, we solve the Maxwell equation. This is a, just a wave equation for vector potential. And because the macroscopic field changes slowly, we prepare rather coarse grid to solve this Maxwell equation. Then at each point, we consider electron we prepare electronic motion. So we solve many, many electronic motion. Then at each position, we have a vector potential at this position. And then we supply the electric current at position here. And this calculation gives the input is the electric field here and output is the current at this position by this way we can solve the both equations simultaneously, but the computationally, this is very different. We prepare two grid system. So we call it the multi-scale approach because the, we prepare two grid system, coarse grid for macroscopic electromagnetic field and the fine grid for electronic dynamics. Okay, let me show one example. This is the one my 
So now the thickness of the material is comparable to the wavelengths of light. We prepare 200 grid point inside this spin film. So we actually calculate 200 electronic motion inside the material. I just show front point, middle point, and back point, three point of the electronic motion. So you can now see the electrons are moving at each position and then the transmitted wave and reflected wave appears. So we can calculate the motion of electrons. So the after laser pulse gone away, the, at the front position, there is a strong excitation of electrons, but the other positions, the excitation is not so much after the laser pulse gone away. Okay, looking at the, again, the laser pulse is attenuating inside the material and transmitted wave and reflected wave. So excitation is strong at the front surface, but not so much in middle and back surface. So after laser pulse gone away, so yeah, one of the unique future is that reflected pulse is more or less similar shape as the incident pulse, but the transmitted pulse has an almost flat envelope because the high intensity part was the energy was transferred to material. So the pulse shape looks very different. And taking Fourier transformation, we get the high harmonic generation, but the generation between reflected and transmitted parts looks very different. Okay, I show a few examples, but I do not have much time left, maybe five minutes. So I just show two examples. Okay, one example. Okay, let me just concentrate for this one example. High harmonic generation, the how the propagation effect is important. So yeah, I just showed the, okay, high harmonic generation and the, this is the high harmonic generation in reflected wave and transmitted wave. As I said, the, okay, one micrometer result is just I showed, green cup, reflected wave here, and transmitted wave is here. So pulse shape is rather different. But for 10 nanometer case, for very thin film, the high harmonic generation is almost the same between reflected and transmitted one. And also it's important that, yeah, opposite to intuition, the high harmonic generation, nonlinear wave is the strongest when the thickness is very, very thin. So yeah, we first expect for thicker material because there are many, many atoms, the, we, get, we can get a strong nonlinear signal. But what we found, found was that the stronger nonlinear signal can be obtained at the very thin film. So this is because the, even though the high harmonic generation is generated at the material, it will soon be absorbed again inside the material. So the thin material is more uh, useful to generate the strong signal. And also the reflected and transmitted wave is almost the same. This is very simple result because the, for very thin film, there is a continuity of the vector potential between reflected wave and transmitted wave. And instant wave has only the field of fundamental field, original frequency. So high harmonic generation in reflected and transmitted field should be the same for very thin film. And other behavior is the for more than 200 nanometer, 
the reflected high hum generation is almost the same. This is very natural. The reflected wave generated at the surface. So it do not, does not depend on the thickness of the material. But for transmitted wave, the spectrum depend on very much on the material thickness. And you find there is a dip around here, around 20 electron volt. And we can understand by our analysis of our calculation that the, okay, high frequency part comes from the front surface of the material. This high harmonic wave goes through the material and comes to the transmitted wave here, this component. But the lower component is produced at the back surface and emitted to the vacuum. So this kind of the change of the mechanism is observed in the generation of high harmonic generation for thickness of one micrometer, 1,000 nanometer case. So now my lecture is almost end. So let me just, this is one advertisement. I, the, yeah, we are making a open source software project, Salmon. Salmon is the scalable ab initio light matter simulator for optics and nanoscience. Salmon is the abbreviation of this one. And okay, let me say, I spent one month to find this word. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, it's a very good abbreviation, abbreviation. But the all the calculation I showed, almost all calculations, I used this uh, code. So yeah, if you have interest, just download and try it, the use of this code. Okay, this is summary of my lecture, real time TDDFT. Yeah, I hope you feel, you agree that the real-time TDDFT is of some use for light matter interaction, especially nonlinear regime. So these are the young collaborators involved in this Salmon project. So these people are uh, developing code and the collaborating with me with many directions of works. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I'd like to have your questions and comments. Okay, thank you, Professor Yabana. So it's time for questions and uh, discussions. So if you have any questions, please uh, ask uh, with your microphone on, or you can type in the chat window. Seon has your question, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the nice talk again. Um, so I have a question about the E field perpendicular to the interface. So far, you are showing us the incident E field where electric field is parallel to the surface. But the, mm -hmm. if, if we have, like, let's say, P polarized light, then there are out of plane component of electric field, and mm -hmm. you may expect some plasmonic response, which may be beneficial to high harmonic generation. So do you have my question? Have you tried and what your expectation about that? Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I prepared one a few slides for the irradiation at oblique incidence. That we just started. The yeah, at the oblique incidence, the electric field is yeah, if the electric field is parallel to the surface of the material, it's a S polarization. In perpendicular, it's a P polarization. And the, this is, sorry, there are some Japanese, but the, it's a transmittivity. The, for the P polarization, there is some angle where there is no uh, transmission of the pulse. So anyway, the, it, this is linear uh, optics, but the, there are some uh, uh, difference of the uh, optical response. So, the but the yeah let me just tell the yeah we just started this one and we have one publication this last year 
and how this kind of the oblique incidence can be calculated in our framework. And yeah, just, I, yeah, it can be done. We can write the oblique incidence Maxwell equation as a, just a one dimensional wave equation is possible, but the coordinate X and Z are mixed up. So it's a very interesting equation. Z direction and X direction are mixed up. And then we can calculate the, how the strong pulse light uh, emitted uh, interact with the surface. So for example, the reflectivity at the Brewster angle, originally there is no reflection, but gradually for strong field, the reflection starts to work. That, that kind of the uh, phenomena can be investigated. So, yeah, question was the how is the plasmonics? That is a very interesting topic for uh, metals. And, but the still, we need to um, somewhat more complex geometry because the, to couple the light with the plasmonic wave, it requires uh, some wave, uh, uh, wave number matching. But anyway, the direction to such direction, it's just we are starting. I see, but, but we, you have a slab, so then in that case, that there can be a, when you have a thin slab, then the outer plane plasma can mix with outer plane light, I, I suppose. You mean the- When, yes. when, yeah, when you have a thin no, slab, no. then the, yes, outer yeah, plane. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah but the, if you have the maximum equation, then the, it's a very difficult job actually, even for to manage. Yeah, the for the yeah, not parallel, but the oblique incidence. The, we can investigate the motion of electrons. That is possible. Mm -hmm. But the, how it act to the, works to the reflection or transmission for optical uh, information, then it's uh, not so simple to manage. Okay. I see, thank you. Uh, Professor Abana, I uh, have also questions. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent, uh, nice uh, lectures. Uh, so my question is about some, uh, maybe some specific of your Maxwell TDFT implementations, uh, particularly for the uh, multi-scale uh, versions. So uh, it seems that uh, you are doing simulation for TDFT uh, at different uh, regions of this slab. And I have some uh, difficulty on the, in understanding the, whether you have uh, this connection between uh, these different TDFT regions. Uh, so is it like one way uh, the, the communications or do you have some kind of uh, feedback loop between different uh, the solid regions? So you have like a front regions and back region of the slab and then in the middle. So you are showing like a three regions, uh, how they respond uh, to this instant wave. Uh, but then uh, do you have some kind of a, uh, like one global uh, simulation that connects all these uh, TDDFT calculations or are you assuming that uh, it, they are more or less independent? Yeah, I do not get well the question. Your question was the yeah, so you have this grid number one and grid number two, let's say in this case, mm -hmm. and then uh, later in the silicon uh, micrometer uh, thick slab uh, example, you are showing like three regions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I was wondering uh, whether you are uh, eventually connecting all these different uh, autonomous regions. So uh, basically my question is whether you are doing one that uh, very big uh, DFT calculation for the micrometer regions, uh, what does mean you are not doing that? Then is that right? 
So could you go to the maybe silicon example where you have micrometer thick uh, examples? So this one? Oh, yes. Uh, right. So we have front region, middle region, and back regions. Um, so they yeah. are definitely atomic scale. Uh, so regular mm -hmm. TD calculation can be performed. But then I was assuming there is like communications between these different TDDFT uh, simulation regions. Okay, the, I understand your question is the, how these regions are communicated to each, with each other. Exactly, yes. Yeah, okay. So in this framework, we the communication is only through this macroscopic Maxwell equation. Mm -hmm. So because the, each calculation of the microscopic world, the this each point, the input is the vector potential at this position and the output is the current at this position. So the, through the Maxwell equation, all the information is exchanged through this uh, mac macroscopic Maxwell equation. That is all. So we do not take into account the direct interaction between these cells. Okay, so uh, exactly. So that's kind of approximation. So I was wondering whether- Okay, uh, so but the, you, I'd like to say that the, it is a natural extension of the ordinary macroscopic Maxwell equation. So I mean the, okay, if the field is sufficiently weak, then at each position, this, is, this gives a current that is determined by dielectric function. So for weak field, this naturally goes back to the uh, ordinary macroscopic Maxwell equation. So if we make some interaction between these two, then it will not go to the ordinary Maxwell equation. So yeah, in my opinion, this multi-scale implementation is a natural extension of the ordinary macroscopic Maxwell equation to nonlinear regime. Mm -hmm. oh, but then uh, at the end of the day, you are interested in uh, very nonlinear or uh, high field uh, situations, is that right? Yeah. But then uh, still in that case, uh, you are assuming that uh, the communications might be negligible? Yeah, it's the, perhaps the question is whether the, this macro, micro, uh, Maxwell equation is sufficient or not. For example, if the electrons are excited, then there is a interaction through thermal motion and so on. And that, that kind of the interaction we at present do not include. But the, because the light wave the moves in the speed of light. So it's the fastest one. So I think the, this coupling by Maxwell equation is the most important and quick one. And other effect will be rather slow. That, that's my uh, expectation or uh, some hope, my hope. Okay, I'm aware so. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? So if not, then let's thank uh, Professor Yabana again for a great lecture. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yabana. Thank you. Yeah. So